when you knocked upon my door early this morning when you knocked upon my door I said hello Satan I believe it's time to go me and the devil was walking inside me and the devil was walking side by side I'm gonna be my woman till I get satisfied my baby she don't know she said why Baby says she don't know why I got a dog around. Must be that old evil spirit buried deep down in the ground. You may bury my body down by the highway side. Baby, I don't care where you bury my body when I'm dead and gone. You may bury my body down by the highway side. So my old evil spirit can catch a greyhound bus and ride. Give me a T for Texas, a T for Tennessee, log long. Give me a T for Texas, a T for Tennessee, and a T for Thelma. That gal that made a wreck out of me. I ho lay, ay, yo lay, yo, yo lay. out there that are <clears throat> allergic to yodeling, but uh, in today's uh, installment of um, uh, the series that we've been uh, going over with the history of popular music um, before the internet happened and sucked all the cash out, those of you who have been around from the very beginning uh, might recall that when I first, I think I just bumped the microphone, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Uh, some of you will remember that when I first started this series, I began with uh, my driving on tour, playing shows across the country, and I was in um, uh, Mississippi, northern Mississippi, I guess, um, coming across I-20, is that northern? I don't even anywhere, Meridian, where I see a sign that says Jimmy Rogers Museum, and I, you know, dart my way over it. So that was a song by Jimmy Rogers, the yodeling, singing, break man, who uh, is widely considered the father of American country and Western music. What makes him that, what makes him that character, that, that father of, uh, it is um, uh, many things, but n n chiefly it's his uh, uh, ability to take and coalesce 
to uh, amalgamate all of these disparate influences with which he created his own sound, uh, from uh, the blues of African Americans to the yodeling of German immigrants, <laughs> and of course the oompa music of the walking dum bum bass line from German immigrants, and so on, uh, to the jazz coming out of New Orleans, Dixieland, um, and that sort of thing, uh, from uh, that area, um, from the Creoles, and so on. Um, many various types of disparate music, which, you know, during that time, pre-television, pre-radio uh, even, um, when he was coming up, there was um, vaudeville and uh, traveling minstrel shows. And that is um, how, in the South, at any rate, a lot of these disparate types of um, entertainment were seen, heard, um, as these troops would tour through. A lot of it was, um, you know, uh, body and so on. And it was, it was Grand Guignol, I think is how it's pronounced, but I'm, don't quote me on that. I don't speak French. Uh, but it borrows from this sort of uh, bombast of the continent. And some of it is continental music even. European, certainly. Um, in any event, I began here tonight with uh, uh, Robert Johnson, <clears throat> who is the king of the Delta Blues, uh, right? Who, in his short and tragic life, um, crafted some very interesting tunes, um, but who was, you know, his life was cut short, and but he has been, he was um, immortalized um, in that event, uh, as a person who, who had sold his soul to the devil and so on, and and, and in the you know for instance with all the British uh, rock blues guys in the '60s and '70s, from Eric Clapton to Jimmy Page to Jeff Beck to so on and so forth, Peter Green. I mean you know um, they all uh, heard this this cat and heard about you know heard the lyrics of his tunes and his uh, sort of uh, uh, romantic way of uh, singing about the devil. Um, and uh, we're drawn in to his myth, his mythology, and his symbolism. Well, so when, you know, Robert Johnson was trying to earn a living as a guitar player in Mississippi in the 1920s, uh, he was going around to these towns and busking. He was out playing on the street corners, and he was playing for white audiences, uh, trying to get them to throw some money into his hat, um, or his guitar case, uh, and he oftentimes would get involved in this uh, cutting heads. Um, a lot. Of, this is really well illustrated in the PBS documentary American Masters on Robert Johnson, when they when they really go into depth about how that sort of um, competition between two street musicians would go down. In any case, he was nonetheless for sure trying to earn some money down there in Mississippi, and the most popular singer. For that white audience, he was trying to get dollars from was a guy by the name of Jimmy Rogers. Period. He was he was a superstar of the time, and for sure, if Mr. Johnson wanted to make any loot, he was playing Jimmy Rogers tunes. Now, I find this very interesting. Like for instance, if you look at Thirty Two Twenty Blues uh, by Robert Johnson, which is an ode to gun violence and uh, and and domestic violence. The lyrics, uh, there is a phrase in there about, I'm going to get me a pistol, I'm going to get me a Gatling gun that is literally lifted straight out of a Jimmy Rogers tune. Um, and then I just played some of the Thief for Thelma, Thief for Thelma, <laughs> you say that five times fast. Um, T for Thelma, T for you know Tennessee and all that. Um, T for Tennessee, <laughs> Texas. Um, that song, of course, is also an ode to gun violence. Now, Tonight, and then this, you know, I wanted to illustrate that. I want to show how nothing happens in a vacuum. And while, uh, you know, it's certainly true uh, that Jimmy Rogers was borrowing heavily from African American music when he was coming along, it's also true that African Americans were borrowing right back that were, you know, were able to put it into the blues itself. Um, and I think that it's often lost on people just how it all works, which is to say, an amalgamation, a melting pot in America where all of these different disparate uh, influences and uh, backgrounds coalesce and, and, and form uh, this fabric of American music throughout the 20th century. 
And I find it all very interesting. Um, but obviously the gun violence and uh, misogyny, not so hot, right? Especially with our modern ears. Um, but it wasn't hot then either, <laughs> you know? So, um, the, the, but I want to do a little theory crafting. And, um, and not to try and defang it or, or take anything away from the awfulness of it all. But rather to sort of look at where we are versus where they were versus where it all comes from. Now, this is pure speculation on my part, um, but I find it interesting, for instance, if you go back to, say, uh, the period of Victorian England, right, in England, everyone wanted a Wilkie Collins novel or, or some Charles Dickens or something. There were these serialized penny dreadfuls, they called them, um, which were, uh, or, or there would be broadsheets or so on. And there were always these stories about murderers and, and just arsenic and all rape and all of this really tawdry crap, right? It's sort of um, over the top uh, in its um, sort of romanticizing of uh, violent crime even um, and convoluted too, to be sure. In, and this, you know, Jack the Ripper aside, this was a period of time that statistically the crime rates were extremely low. The murder rates in particular were just infinitesimally smaller than they are now. And I find it fascinating because while these things rarely, if ever, happened in anyone's life, it was the type of entertainment that so many folks were drawn to. Um, and, you know, when vaudeville is going across, the, and when I, when I made the reference earlier to the Grand Guignol, and again, I, I'm probably butchering that, I'm not, I, I, it's, was, um, it was a type of uh, French um, uh, acting troupe or whatever, they had a, uh, they had their a building and a stage and everything, but it was um, an acting gig where it was always gory, violent, uh, over-the-top sort of um, uh, stuff, um, you know, very Tim Burton-esque or whatever, uh, that everybody wanted to go check out. But it was shock theater. It wasn't, um, but it didn't really reflect a reality that anyone had going on at the time, you know? Um, and I would argue that the same is true for the Jimmy Rogers, Robert Johnson period. Not to say that there wasn't that violent crime. Of course, Robert Johnson himself uh, died by being poisoned after having slept with somebody's wife down there in Mississippi, which is never a good thing, by the way. Uh, you know, but it, it, so I'm not trying to, to, to uh, say that there wasn't violent. There was plenty of violent crime because any violent crime is too much. But relatively speaking, it really it really wasn't that much, <laughs> and certainly not as much as it is today, um, even in terms of, uh, you know, per capita or whatever. And so, these horrific, gory, and over-the-top uh, sorts of pieces um, owe themselves to something, don't they? Uh, a interest or a, uh, uh, a need for certain people, for us, for all of us, I guess, to, to um, vicariously experience these sorts of stories and so on, on a, on a certain level. But on the other hand, does one make the argument that they lead to that sort of violent crime by hearing and seeing these things or playing these video games? I just, I don't think so. I mean, you know, there weren't a bunch of Jack the Rippers that jumped up in the, in the Penny Dreadful period. Um, you know, and it certainly it wasn't any, it, it was no more impactful at the time of Robert Johnson in terms of being widespread. And I'm saying this having, you know, grown up with my great-grandmother Ola telling me as a little kid about her uncle who had a, had a um, convenience store or a gas station, not a convenience store, gas station back then, who, uh, you know, and this is very, you know, much the Bonnie and Clyde era, where one day these folks came in to get some gas and they didn't have any money and took uh, and shattered a, Coke bottle and stabbed the man over and over again until his guts were hanging out. And he dragged himself all the way back to his home, pulled himself up to the door before he, before he passed away, um, had bled to death. Um, and that was in the 19, you know, 20s or whatever, 30s. Um, and so, again, I'm not trying to say that violent crime didn't exist at the time. It did. 
It just didn't on the level that one might necessarily assume. And so, anyway, uh, this one is a little funny. You know, this is an interesting and hard to, for me to, uh, sort of put a fine point on specific things. I just wanted to highlight them more or, or, or less and, and have a conversation as opposed to definitively giving one uh, answer or another about how it all works necessarily because I don't know. Um, I, I'm rather wanting to see if I can um, open up a conversation a little bit about this aspect of things. Whereas in earlier episodes, you know, when we talked about misogyny, or rather, um, we talked about um, uh, the hegemonies and so on, and uh, religion and all of these other aspects, conservatism that were going on, um, all of that I, I feel pretty confident in, in my position on, and I think I can prove historically. Uh, whereas this is a little bit less um, uh, that. It's a little harder to... Um, to necessarily wrap your mind around, at least for me. Um, and I think that in light of all of this been going on in the last, oh, I don't know, five, six years with gun violence, holy shit, you know what I mean? Um, and, and how whacked out everything's become. Um, I think that it's a conversation that while I, I'm not trying to offer any answers to this situation, I think it's a conversation worth having to um, try and get more people uh, to, to come to terms with we have, you know, the problems that we do have um, and, and in trying to figure out how to better solve them. Um, well, and so I'm, I'm going to give entertainment a pass uh, to an extent um, because I don't believe that just by seeing uh, violence or something, you're going to necessarily want to commit a violent act. Um, but having access to those weapons, on the other hand, is a, is a different conversation, right? Um and again, lest one forget. I mean, I, I'm not going to get into my, my own personal backstory, but let's just say I've had firearms drawn on me with the intent to use deadly force on several occasions. Um, twice by law enforcement, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm not a person of color, so I'm still alive, sadly. I mean, not sadly, I'm glad to be alive, but, you know, that's why. Like, let's be real. Uh, again, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds, but, you know, uh, I've also had, you know, a person pull their weapon on me that was a civilian as well. Um, anyway, um, a couple of times. <laughs> uh, anyhow, um, guns, man. Um, not, uh, I don't know what else to really say. Um, other than I wanted to have this conversation. If anyone wants to leave a comment below and, and, and maybe give their opinion on the whole thing. But, um, yeah, I also wanted to, to certainly get back into uh, Jimmy Rogers, his influence on things, and talk again about this cross-pollination of disparate influences which make up the, the fabric of, of American music. Uh, it's not so much always about culture. Well, I sent for my baby, man, but she don't come. Well, I sent for my baby, man, but she don't come. Well, them doctors in her spring show sure can't help her none. Oh, she gets unruly and thinks she don't want to. If she gets unruly and thinks she don't want to. Take my 32 20, I cut her half in two. Uh, she got a 38 special, boys, I believe that's much too light. She got a 38 special, I believe it's much too light. I got my 32 20, gonna make them caps all right. Well, I sent for my baby, man, she don't come. I said for my baby, man, she don't come. All them doctors in hospital sure can't help her none. I say I'm gonna shoot my pistol, gonna shoot my Gatling gun. I'm gonna shoot my pistol, gonna shoot my Gatling gun. You made me love you, now your man has come. 
got 38 special boys, I believe that's much you like. You got 38 special boys, I believe it much you like. I'll take my 32 twins and make them caps all right. I just can't take my risk. 